The East Isle Historical Society was founded in 1992 by a gentleman by the name of Patrick Smith uh, in the summer. The, the first meetings were held in his house in August of 1992, which makes this year, 2012, our 20th anniversary. Uh, Pat was active in several historic societies over the years, uh, most notably Lake Ronkonkoma, where he was, I'm pretty sure he was a founding member there too, and uh, he brought them up, and he's pretty much our figurehead, and you know, yeah, he also went on to become the president of ASHES, which is the Association of Suffolk County Historical Societies. So we started off at about seven or eight members, myself included. The, uh, the newsletter started out as one page, typewritten, and as, as has progressed through the years. And our membership has grown to about 150 in 2012. Almost, almost half of our members live out of state. Our geographical area covers the same territory as the East Islip School District. So it's three zip codes. We cover Great River, Islip Terrace, and East Islip. Regular meetings are held the first Wednesday of every month at the Joyce Fitzpatrick Center on the grounds of Brookwood Hall, which is a very historic building. And our board meetings are held here downstairs. This is downstairs at the East Islip Public Library, the local history room, which was established in 2004, in conjunction with us, with the East Islip Historical Society and the East Islip Public Library. We have a great partnership with them. Uh, they have their collections down here. We have our collections down here and two sets of display cases. Also, the quintessential Long Island Lighthouse collection is also housed here. It was donated to the library by one of our past presidents, Bob Muller. That's here. And also, the Hibernian Society of East Islip, which is a very big organization, very active in the community, has their history stored here. So it's a one-stop shop for all your historical needs. Uh, we try to rotate these displays. Uh, on a quarterly basis. Sometimes we don't, sometimes we do. You know, it's, it's hard to get you know, the materials in and out. But it's very popular. Every time somebody comes down here and sees it, we get congratulatory emails and letters written saying what a great resource for the community. We also host elementary school groups here. We host uh, Cub Scout and Girl Scout groups here by appointment. Uh, we give them a tour, we show them historical things, we give them uh, a match game to play and we, we try to get their interest in history. You know, there, there's always a couple of oh wows and I didn't know that and it's good to see the, the interest in their faces. So we work closely with those groups. Part of our mission statement for, with the East Islip Historic Society is to preserve as many of the old houses, the ephemera, people's memories, oral histories, what, what anything that pertains to the past for those three towns. It, it, it's, it's very important for children and younger people to know that because what is that saying? When, when you, you don't know history, it tends to repeat itself. You know, they, and, and when you look back through the old newspapers, it's the same political conflicts. It's the same land conflicts. It's the same conflicts from years ago. It's just brought again and again. It just keeps coming up and around. Also, these historic houses, they're never coming back. They're never going to build houses with that craftsmanship and that beauty and the artistic uh, input into these buildings. Now everything is cookie cutter. It's just put up, even houses in the, in, the, in the Hamptons that they spend millions of dollars on, most of them are hideous. Some of them get knocked down within a couple of years because they don't attach themselves to people like these old houses. When you look around at the, at the estates that are left here, like Hewlett and, and Brookwood Hall and, and the, the cutting land, the houses draw you in. You have to go inside to see what the inside looks like. You feel comfortable in those houses. You know, I've been in a few houses, like in the, we have a rich section back here in the moorings, and I've been in houses on Dune Road in Southampton. They're sort of cold. They don't, you know, I, I, I appreciate the money spent. I appreciate even the view and maybe the materials, but the houses are cold. That may be just my opinion, but I've heard it from more than one person. They don't pull you in. They're not going to last. These houses, given the right people to help support them, are going to last, are going to last. So we try to catch builders and developers and the town and whoever wants to knock this stuff down we try to intervene you know we're a small organization but you know we try to do as much as we can we had uh there's a train station great river train station it had the westbound lean to was one of two left on long island the long island railroad was modernizing the station and lifting up the platforms we knew they were going to knock it down we just sent a letter and to the long island railroads uh praise they moved the lean-to to the other side put it sideways and now it's it's going to have a plaque on it saying it's historical value 
Okay. Long Island Railroad yeah. worked with us. They moved the lean-to around. They paint it whenever it needs to be painted. And the, this, the other one burned. So now that's the last one left. They used to be all over the railroad lines, and almost every station had one of these lean-tos built in the 1890s. So we, we're very proud of it. We have a plaque, and there's going to be another plaque for the lean-to. We also stopped them from diverting. These are just a few of the things that we've done. From diverting one of the main roads in East Lyons up the, uh, the uh, Irish Lane meeting Montauk Highway, it's got a jog to go down another road, and some of the more affluent people put together a petition to get the road strained, which would have changed the nature, you know, would have changed the character of Main Street. It would have made it a straight through thoroughfare through the Brookwood Hall land. So we vocalized against that, and and it didn't happen. Also, the uh, the Axel Park Museum, the town wanted to put it under the aegis of Dowling. So we, we didn't want it outsourced because we knew that they would change the nature of the building, of the Brookwood Hall building. So we wrote, started a letter campaign, which was very successful. We were acknowledged by the town supervisor uh, towards our efforts of, you know, he, he understood what the town wanted, what our constituency wanted. <clears throat> and they didn't give it to Dowling. They put it under the aegis of a, the other organization that's in that building, the Isop Arts Council that Linda Moran runs. So we sort of partnered up with her at that point. She approached us for our support. It was an idea that was, you know, close to our hearts. And we've been doing projects with her ever since. Uh, including exhibitions and the, the Orphan's Tree recreation. And we work very closely with her and we work very closely with this library. We have two great relationships there. For some reason, I guess maybe there's a key event in your past, but my father, wherever we were, would always point out old buildings and what was to the point where it would drive you crazy. So now I've passed that tradition on to my daughter and as we're driving down the street, she yells out to me before I can tell her what was there. So the, uh, the, uh, there's a spark that happens when you're a youth. Also, we, when we moved out here from Brooklyn, we moved to Connecticut Avenue. We were directly behind the Westbrook Farms, which was, which was one of the oldest buildings around in this area. It was built by Stanford White in the 1800s. It was ancient. It had brick arches and stone roof and giant hinges, and it just fascinated me. And I would run through the woods in the back of my yard, and we would just play there. And they were very nice to let us play there, as long as we didn't wreck nothing. And we were just immersed in history. You went back in time when you went there. You, know, you, there was, you couldn't hear the cars. All you could see was horses and cows and chickens. And you may as well have been in the 1800s. So like a plow would go by, but you know, like I said, you were immersed in old time. So I, just, I was collecting, I would collect old comics and old car books and I just collected old stuff. And, and when, when I saw the ad in the paper that Pat Smith had put in 1992, I was between jobs and you know, I was at a pivotal point in my life and this seemed made for me. You know? So I just went to the first meeting to check it out. They made me the treasurer. They volunteered me for the newsletter and they were very nice people and they still are today. I still consider them all my friends and it became, uh, it became a very joyous thing to do. And as I learned, as, as, as the history of East Islip unfolded in Islip Terrace and Graver and all of the South Shore, it just becomes, once you get hooked, it's more and more interesting. When you find out all the people that have come and gone, the buildings that have come and gone, the uses of the land and even the Indians and all that, it's, to me it's fascinating. And I'm, I'm trying to pass that on to my daughter and I think she's getting it. So that's, and I keep, I, I've been probably everything I think in the society. I've been secretary, everything but treasurer, vice president three or four times. I'm the president now. I've always done the newsletter. I've always done the website. Uh, and I've always been the archivist. I've always held the collection because I just like to look at that stuff and I like to, I feel like I'm bringing it, it's my responsibility to bring this stuff from the past into the future.